This week's On Story creator and executive producer Rob Thomas discusses his process behind the hit series, Veronica Mars. Here's what teaching high school gave me that has been very fortunate for my career is I got to listen to high school girls talk. As a yearbook advisor, you're working late into the night after school, and I became a piece of furniture to them. And so I just got to hear rich dialogue that I would go on to use for five novels and two TV series. In this episode, writer, creator, and executive producer Rob Thomas joins us for a live taping at Austin Film Festival's On Story premiere party to discuss his process behind the hit series Veronica Mars, Party Down, and I, Zombie. Thomas deep dives into the art, craft, and business of creating successful and beloved television series. For those of you who weren't aware, he actually went to school here and played football in San Marcos and then at TCU and then came to UT. So kind of back home. So welcome home. Oh, thanks. Can you talk a little bit about the journey that took you um, essentially to teaching? I was going to school out in Westlake. My dad here was the vice principal of Westlake High School at the time, and I was going to junior high out there, and my seventh grade counselor said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, well, I want to be a writer, and to me that felt like uh, that meant I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to write books. And by the time I was in high school, like that thought, it, it seemed like such a pipe dream to me and I got into journalism and I became the editor of the high school paper and I thought I'm going to be a journalist and I started thinking about teaching as a career and I'd have summers off. How much were you mining those years, the in-between years when you were teaching? Here's what teaching high school gave me that has been very uh, fortunate for my career is I got to listen to high school girls talk. You know, I I was a high school journalism teacher. And, you know, as a yearbook advisor, you're working late into the night after school. And I became a piece of furniture to them. <laughs> and so I just got to hear rich dialogue um, <laughs> that I would go on to use for five novels and two TV series. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a very fortunate period in my life. I'll kick it off with really kind of talking about Veronica Mars. I'm really interested in how you were thinking about that. I know you started writing in a different format and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you have this idea and it's like, okay, now we've got to pitch it. But that show's actually a really complicated show. It's, um, you know, you've got a big overarching mystery. You've got individual episode mysteries and then you have a lot of raging hormones in each episode that it's it's like ping pong back and forth who's going to be with whom when i signed um my second book deal with simon and schuster they bought two new novels from me um just based on log lines and so i'd written two for them i owed them another two and one of them was just called untitled teen detective and it was set here in Austin. What became Neptune High was originally going to be Westlake High School. It was the high school where the rich kids went. And um, the main character was going to be a teen boy named Keith Mars. Um, and, uh, and so I had that idea in my head. But then I got my... I got my first job on Dawson's Creek. I went out to L.A. It's not going to surprise you to hear that TV pays better than than writing young adult novels. And, um, and so that idea existed, um, and I wanted to get back to it. But the show that I, I think left my own sort of taste that I would have done like I wanted to write freaks and geeks. I, I wanted, I wanted to do just a straight coming of age show. You know, I just wanted to write about teenagers and and their their lives. And um, and when that brilliant show got canceled, I thought, well, if if that show can't make it as good as it is, 
there's no way right now I'm going to be able to sell that sort of show. And it got me thinking about my teen detective idea. And I thought, I thought suddenly that I could sell it on two words, like, like it's a two word pitch, teen noir. The other thing that began to interest me was I really was, I, I felt like this generation that I taught, you know, the, the kids who are 10 years younger than me. And I think it's even more true now, but at the time I thought it is such a generation that it experiences a loss of innocence quicker than mine did, uh, that they know more stuff earlier and that's not always good. And suddenly it just became more interesting to me um, to write a show about a teenage girl being stripped of all of that. Um, it felt like it was just a, had a better dramatic hook, which is when Keith Mars became Veronica Mars. Where's Lily? But everyone knows this story. The murder of Lily Kane. It was on the cover of People magazine. It made entertainment tonight. The town flooded with journalists. <laughs> Duncan, talk to me, please. And of course, everyone remembers reading about the bungling local sheriff, the one who went after the wrong man. That bungling sheriff was my dad. It's the way that I Trojan horsed a coming of age story onto the air because at the time I, I was not particularly interested in noir or mysteries. I didn't know how to break a mystery. And now it's like my stock and trade. If there is a blonde woman solving a mystery on television, I'm probably attached to that show. <laughs> to me, it was, especially season one, it was very much all's fair in love and war. And it definitely had some Game of Thrones moments in it, pre-Game <laughs> of Thrones. It's very not freaks and geeks. <laughs> and so that was your first showrunner show, right? Uh, no, actually, I had uh, my first one was a show called Cupid in oh, Cupid, 1999 yeah. that uh, starred Jeremy Piven uh, as a character who you didn't know whether he was actually the Roman god of love or crazy. And we played it sort of like Miracle on 34th Street, and we did 15 episodes of that show. Yeah. So that was a great show. <laughs> I, I was really proud of that show. Um, uh, and, it, you know, the, the one thing it did do is David Kelly, who uh, saw the show and asked me to run his new show. And Cupid was still on the air, and... I thought, well, this is very weird. He's asking me to run his new show. I have my own show on television, but apparently David Kelly knew how to read the Nielsen ratings, and I, and I did not. Um, I became available. Um, There's so much of that still same tone throughout all your stuff. Right? I mean, it's, it really feels consistent. Um, you know, there's a lot of sarcasm. The thing that I'm looking for is sort of the blend of drama and comedy like I'm I would never be like I I should I, I don't have the ability the talent to write set up punchline set up punchline and yet I'm bored if I'm just writing straight drama so I want writers who manage to in the rhythm of a normal conversation have some wit to what they're saying you know what I'm really looking for is delicious language you probably wrote the first script. Mm. How much did the show change by episode 22 from your original intent for Veronica's character and, and uh, Logan and all the other people that sort of grew as you're w working with this writer's room? I knew who killed Lily Kane. You know, <laughs> uh, I knew how Veronica was raped. And then once you know those things... And and you know the details of how those things happen. You build the whole city, not uh, the whole season, trying to not step on anything, um, and then you can develop red herrings. And at the time, uh, 
the internet on the internet there was television without pity before twitter and and it was such an interesting device at the time because you know we could see we could actually read in real time who is the leading suspect and can we divert attention away from that person and um and there were certainly changes that we i, I had there was no plan to make logan a a romantic interest he was going to be the obligatory psychotic jack <laughs> that she describes in episode 1 and yet we're all watching dailies when those two are on screen going oh my god we we need to write to that we need to make that happen and let's not forget logan eccles his dad makes 20 million a picture you probably own his action figure. Every school has an obligatory psychotic jacket. He's ours. So the goal was to not step on the long arc mystery and uh, everything else was much more organic. Every, as long as we didn't step on that, we could just sort of break each episode on its own. The mystery element part of it, which of course, I, I mean, I think that's just as interesting as the high school shenanigans, you know? Mm -hmm. So that part of communicating with your room, like when you're sending somebody off to write an episode, is each, each individual mystery in each one, like, uh, for instance, the, um, the one where they're all taking the teen test. <sighs> Listen to this. Not that innocent? Buy the results of anyone's purity test. $10 will let you know if you're dating an angel from heaven or a hottie from hell. That's crazy. You could go in there and buy anyone's test? I never thought I'd say this, but I kind of can't wait for school tomorrow. Were you sending that person off like in a typical room where they've pitched their idea and then they're going to go beat it out? The mysteries are all broken in the room, and that's what it is the one issue with the way I staff a show where I try to find all these funny character writers and then force them to write a procedural is that none of us are trained in it. I, I had never written a mystery before. We've sort of learned along the way. Like we spent a lot of time in those writers' rooms trying to break mysteries and where do you lay in clues? Where does the MacGuffin comes in? Are there are, are there any red herrings? We're practically having to look up noir and wikipedia to um to figure out what we're supposed to be doing we're now practiced at it i i sort of it comes a bit easier now but it is veronica mars is one of the hard hardest shows you can imagine to break because to break a mystery every episode and a 22 episode mystery at the same time you're keeping so many storylines in the air um that it felt like such a relief once, if you're the writer, to get out of the story breaking stage and just get to write it. That's the fun part. It's the sweating it out of breaking the mystery that is the hard part of that show. So how did you also deal with that tonality in it? You had like an episode like Hot Dogs, which was surprisingly, though you think you kill a dog in the beginning, it's surprisingly right funny and kind of heartwarming. And then you have an episode like Ain't No Magic that was really mm -hmm. another one that was lighthearted and fun and turned into a kind of Nancy Drew, right. you know, it felt like. Um, but then you have Trip to the Dentist and Leave it to Beaver and they're super dark, you know. So how was that working with not just the staff but also with the network, you know? The network um, was great once the reviews started coming in. They were very tough at the beginning uh, of the show and trying to determine what the proper tone is. They wanted adults to be more important characters. That was one of our big fights. I do want to give them credit. They they gave me a um, they gave me a note in the pilot at the very last moment that I that it it took my it took a while for me to get my head around it, but I think it was a very smart note. And in in that pilot episode. We find out that Veronica has been raped. Her best friend has been murdered. Her boyfriend is broken up with her. She's been ostracized by all of her friends at school. Her mom has deserted the family. And in the final scene, Veronica breaks into her dad's safe and finds that there are a stack of postcards from her mother that her dad has kept from her, which puts her on the outs with Keith. What are you doing back here? 
I saw the light. I forgot a few of my books. What's up and at him, Adam, Matt? Come on, it's family fun night. I called out to Mama Leone's. I rented the South Park movie. My favorite. Hey, who's your daddy? You are. Uh, I have to make a stop, so I'll meet you at home. Okay. But hurry up. I worry about you. Yeah, you do. And, I mean, it was a dark pilot, and the network came to me and said, can she at least have her dad in her corner? <laughs> there were some episodes where the, where the case was comedic, like Betty and Veronica, or, you know, stealing the rival mascot's goat, or um, leave it to Beaver being somewhere on the opposite end of the spectrum. I mean, we felt like the show could handle um, both those tones. And part of it is uh, Kristen Bell being such a fantastic actress that she can deliver on that sort of thing. There was, there was a moment in the pilot of Veronica Mars where, you know, and understand when you audition an actor, you see them read this, you know, three or four scenes uh, a handful of times. You don't see them read the whole script or do or perform the whole script. And so we're in day six or seven of filming the pilot and we're shooting this scene where Veronica wakes up in a strange bed, sees her underwear on the floor and weeps. And... And I'm watching Kristen perform this scene, and it, it, it is so mind-boggling to me how powerful, how good she is in the scene. And it does seem like she's a machine, like, okay, how many tears and out of which eye? Like, that, that was how good she was in that scene. And then, interestingly, in the uh, editing process, the network kept making me trim up that scene because they felt like like the sorrow was too much like the audience might not recover from that <laughs> level of whereas I thought wow this now this is a teen drama <laughs> so yeah um that was a that was a battle but um ended up with a pilot that I was proud of yeah not many people get the opportunity to bring their character back at, you know, their teens, their 20s, their 30s, and look back at the person they're now going to create, right? And I know it was getting canceled that gave you that opportunity, but at the same time, it was kind of a cool experiment, right. I think, in looking at how you envisioned this person would really have grown. And in season four, there were some really great moments, especially with her and Logan, where it's clear he's moved on to try to fix himself. And she kind of really hasn't spent a lot of right. time reflecting. And to your point, I think that's what made it such an interesting season at how maybe she had to learn to reflect a little bit more on some of what she did. So how, how was that for you just in each opportunity, both, you know, the first couple of seasons and then the movie looking at it, at, that was a different time period. And then again, years later for another show. We've seen so many shows about men of that age sort of struggling with growing up, struggling with the notion of commitment. I was interested in seeing Veronica struggle with that. It, um, you know, we did a couple Veronica Mars novels that I would help break the story with a with another writer and she would write the book and she did a fantastic job but in that second book i really wanted to play this um this flirtation with deputy leo hey uh so as luck would have it they're playing the uh, big lebowski at the orpheus tonight i'm ready to write this wrong if you are why would i watch it at that moldy dump when i have the director's cut and the ingredients for white russians at home sold what time should i be there that wasn't an invitation. Ooh, sound like one. You are not coming over to Lebowski and chill. 
You're turning this into something tawdry. Uh, what's wrong with a couple of cinephiles watching what you consider to be a classic movie? Unless, unless you were thinking there was something more. I wasn't. Are you afraid to be alone with me? I'm leaving now. And I felt like she, she did not want to write it going as far as I wanted it to go. And so I, I sort of, in the series, it was like, I want to see Veronica tempted. I want to see Veronica struggle with monogamy. I want to see the woman in that position. Um, so that, that was one of the elements that was interesting for me to explore in the Hulu series. Yeah, I think that was pretty cool. But you did it again with um, Party Down, too. So it was like looking back at where somebody goes and creating this whole missing years the, story. Like, were you creating the missing years story? The crazy thing is I even did Cupid twice. Um <laughs> We did we did it in 2000. Uh, we did it in 1999. It was my first show, and then they brought back a version with Bobby Cannavale in 2009. So I end up doing a lot of shows twice. At some point, one of them is going to be a hit. Uh, that is that is the goal. Were you developing a whole backstory in your head for the last 10 years of her life? It was fun for me right before writing that the Veronica Mars movie because I really hadn't watched um, the series since we had finished it. And I, my daughter was born in season one of Veronica Mars. And I think we did the movie when she was 12 and she watched it with me. And it was so cool. It was like, this is the show I wrote for my daughter that I didn't know I was going to have. Um, like she was, she was, um, yeah, she was, she was, very into it. The process of watching it, um, you know, was the process of trying to develop, okay, what has she done in the, uh, uh, in the interim? And interestingly, and almost healthily, I think, my daughter landed on Team Piz, um, which, <laughs> which, good, that, that means we've raised you well, honey. Uh, <laughs> Piz, Piz is a, a good, yeah. decent, gentle soul, and so the notion of uh, of her having a, you know, a solid relationship, uh, having completed law school, I wanted to keep her somewhere within the legal uh, world. Um, uh, that all sort of came to me as I was rewatching the series and sort of just trying to imagine where she landed and. Uh -huh. Yeah. But it was all, it all felt like it was, yeah, I could totally see this character doing all these things right. and then making this other choice. When I wrote the original Veronica Mars script, I thought it was for cable. Um, so the original script, which was, uh, you know, and I mentioned the one thing with her dad, it was, it was another degree darker. And, uh, you know, some of the arguments, I mean, there is a movie called The TV Set that Jake Kasdan directed and David Duchovny stars in it and he stars as a showrunner. And in that, in the, and it's about pilot season and he's making a pilot based on the suicide, his brother's suicide. And that is what the show is about. And at a certain point, Sigourney Weaver playing the network president says, do we need that suicide? It's kind of a bummer. <laughs> And we had shot Veronica Mars. We were we had screened Veronica Mars, and the network president came to me and said, "Do we need that rape story? That's kind of a bummer." I mean, it 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 was as though they wrote that completely about my experience. You've been watching a conversation with Rob Thomas on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 